And I'm going to turn the page over to insects because I see okay. that Elizabeth Rowan has joined us, which is very exciting. Elizabeth, are you ready to roll? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So we are going to move from those pesky nematodes over to, um, so this is almost like a transitional uh, topic before we get to John Gawlowski. And so we're going to talk about is tillage beneficial or detrimental for insect and slug management? Dabbles into some soil stuff too. So I, I know this will cross over to some other people as well. Uh, just to introduce Elizabeth, um, she just finished uh, invigilating an exam or giving an exam, so she's probably exhausted, and I apologize for slamming this in so quickly, but uh, welcome here. Uh, she grew up in Santa Cruz, California and went to Wellesley College just outside of Boston. She has a BA in biology, a master's in entomology from Purdue, um, and then she, oh, it just, there's a lot, PhD in Pennsylvania State. Um, where she studied the effects of soil management techniques, tillage, fertilizers, cover crops, and neonics on plant resistance to herbivores and their predators in both corn and soybean. She is now a service assistant professor at West Virginia University in the Division of Plant and Soil Science. And I don't want to take up your time. So Elizabeth, take it away. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I was very honored to be asked to participate um, in this conference today. And so what I'm hoping to do today is talk a little bit about tillage and try to um, give you a, a whole picture about what tillage does to both pests and predators um, and how can it, it can affect uh, pest management. And this is work that I did at Penn State during my PhD um, with three wonderful people, Dr. Carly Regan, uh, Dr. John Tucker, and Dr. Mary Barbercheck. And so, um, we were investigating the effects of tillage. And as you probably know, North American soils suffer from erosion and soil degradation that can affect uh, soil productivity um, and yield. And uh, a, the most recent estimate of the costs of soil degradation put it at about $8 billion per year. And this was actually a low estimate compared to previous estimates. In the Mid-Atlantic, where I've done a lot of research, um, soil erosion can, uh, is a big concern because um, most of the Mid-Atlantic farms drain into the Chesapeake Bay. And after big storm events like Tropical Storm Lee in 2011, you can actually see the sediment flowing off of this, these farms and into the Chesapeake Bay, where they can cause uh, dead zones and, and contaminate waterways generally and affect the fisheries and wildlife of the Chesapeake Bay, which affects you know, all of the livelihoods that, that are dependent on the Chesapeake Bay, as well as removing really important soil um, on across the region. Um, so Penn State is here in State College, just to orient you a little bit. Um, so this is Washington DC is here. So the Chesapeake Bay is right here. So um, erosion is not just a problem in the mid-Atlantic. So there was a recent uh, article in the Manitoba Cooperator that had this wonderful picture of um, soil erosion in Manitoba. Um, looks like a lot of wind erosion um, coming up. And so it's, it's, a, it's a problem in uh, Manitoba as well. So tillage, um, we're talking about soil erosion and tillage because tillage can have such an effect on erosion and degradation. So tillage can affect um, increased water erosion and wind erosion, like we saw during the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Um, tillage can also, because it's turning the soil up and exposing soil to oxygen, that um, oxygen sort of stimulates microbial degradation of organic matter. So you end up burning up organic matter and it destroys habitat for beneficial soil organisms like this beautiful ground beetle here. So why are we tilling if it has all of these effects on soil? Well, it's a very useful tool, as you probably know, it helps prepare the soil for planting. Um, it's an important weed management tactic, especially in systems where um, herbicides are not allowed, like organic systems. And it's often prescribed for insect pest management. So for example, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee that monitors insecticide resistance 
um, has this lovely video talking about ways to manage resistance and tillage is actually a suggested one. And you see this all the time on different extension websites and, and recommendation websites. Oh, we should have um, tillage be a foundation of cultural controls for insect management. And it certainly works against certain pests. So no-till systems like this one are often um, experience slug outbreaks um, in under wet conditions, um, things like uh, uh, tobacco hornworm on tomatoes using tillage is thought to reduce that. Um, this is because it reduces plant debris and thus habitat for organisms. And it also disrupt, directly disrupts the life cycle of pests in the soil. So you can imagine um, a tobacco hornworm that pupates in the soil. It's got this big pupa getting turned up can both physically destroy it by crushing or cutting it. And it also exposes it to freezing temperatures um, and to predators like birds. So one of the questions that we have is what type of pests is it tillage effective against? And so we wanna know, is it effective against all herbivores? Is it particularly effective against herbivores that spend some time in the soil? Things like beetle larvae, moth pupae, um, herbivores that are soil surface active, running around, uh, eating different things, maybe um, damaging stems and, and stuff like that. Or is it, effect and is it effective against herbivores that spend no part of their life cycle in the soil. So we have some leaf miners and aphids and leaf hoppers that aren't pupating or they're not as, uh, spent laying eggs in the soil or spending time as nymphs or, or uh, larvae in the soil. The contradiction in managing pests with tillage is that the same things that are effective against pests are also likely affecting predators. Right? The, the difference between the life cycles of pests and predators is not that different, um, really. So we can also try to understand what types of predators uh, tillage can have an effect on. Is it everything? Is it all predators? Is it predators that are captured on the soil? We don't really necessarily know the life cycle of all predators. Um, we haven't studied them as much. They're much more diverse. But things like ground beetles, wolf spiders, and ants, we know are active on the soil surface. So that could be that tillage has a bigger effect on those or predators that are active in foliage. So, so things like web building spiders, lady beetles, parasitoid wasps that are all important um, natural enemies of pests. So we also need to think a little bit about different types of tillage. So we're often break tillage down into conservation tillage practices, um, or reduced tillage practices. So things like going to absolutely no tillage, no till, and then we have sort of these intermediate levels of tillage, things that, um, things like strip tilling, chisel plowing and disking that leave some residue. Um, the cutoff is usually put at about 30% on the soil surface. And we can compare that to conventional tillage which doesn't leave any residue on the soil surface. So we get a lot of mold for plowing and, and heavy disking and chisel plowing can also be considered a conventional tillage practice. But it's really a question of how much residue is left and how much that soil is disturbed. So when, what we wanted to answer is how does tillage intensity affect pests and predators? And we guessed, we hypothesized that the more intense tillage, um, so the more closer we get to that conventional, really just heavy disturbance, the lower the arthropod abundance would be. And this would be particularly important for soil dwelling critters and it would affect pests and predators probably the same. So we investigated these questions um, using a technique called meta-analysis, where we extracted data from um, many different papers across many systems. And the advantage of this is that we aren't confined to making conclusions based on a single location or a particular species of plant or um, pests or uh, in a in confined period of time. So we ex use papers that um, I guess studied tillage uh, in field and vegetable crops that compared a uh, conservation or reduced tillage practice to a conventional tillage practice. And we ended up with papers that were published between 1983 and 2017. Um, and the total, we had 27 studies that measured pest abundance and 30 studies that measured predator abundance. 
And I just want to walk you through sort of what the figures look like here because they're a little bit different from what you would otherwise um, see. So what we present is in effect size, which is basically the difference in populations between reduced tillage treatments and conventional tillage treatments. So that means when you have a positive effect size, that means that there were more um, arthropods, there were more insects in the reduced tillage treatment compared to the conventional. Um, when it's negative, that means that there were more insects in the conventional tillage treatment. And when the error bars, these, um, these error bars here, let me move this so you can actually see my thing. These error bars uh, overlap with zero. That means that there was no overall effect. Oops, too far. Um, so what we're doing here is compare, we did three sets of comparisons. We did um, all of the reduced tillage treatments versus the conventional treatment, the conventional treatments. And then we split that into no-till versus conventional and sort of our medium disturbance practices. So, so um, things like strip tilling, disc, um, disking, chisel plowing, that sort of thing versus this, these very disturbing conventional tillage practices. So I'm gonna present three different numbers um, that we examined for each of these, for each, for, for all pests, soil dwelling and, um, and foliar path or foliar insects. So our first question was, does reducing tillage increase pests, right? Do we get more pests? And we expected that pests would increase in reduced till systems, and it would be particularly strong for soil associated pests, right? What we found was no increase in overall pest abundance. So, um, Pests were not more abundant or less abundant in the reduced tillage treatments compared to conventional. We also didn't see an increase in soil associated pest abundance. So this is not what we were expecting to see. What we did find was a decrease in foliar pest abundance in the reduced tillage system compared to the conventional. And we see that in this, era, this um, bar right here. Um, and you can see that that effect is not very strong but it is different from zero. We don't see it when we separate out no-till and medium disturbance tillage. So it's really um, using all of the studies that we can is how we can see this. So what does this mean um, biologically, right? So if we have foliar pests that are more abundant in conventional tillage, this could be because of a couple of things. We could have um, the more disturbance, so, so having um, sort of more of a problem, uh, more of a sort of a, a hurdle for these pests in the conventional tillage will make benefit fast reproducing animals that can come back and recolonize and um, sort of take advantage of, of this disturbance. We also might have more predators in the reduced tillage systems. Um, make Having reduced tillage might make crops harder to find because there might be more weeds. Um, if you're not mixing the soil as deeply or as intensely, it might end up with uneven nutrient availability, slowed nutrient availability, which reduces the, um, the sort of available nutrients for pests. There might be an increase in soil entomopathogens, things like fungus and nematodes that attack um, our insects. And we may have um, soil microbial communities that stimulate plant defense. So the other question that we had was, does tillage decrease predators? All right. So we expected that predators will decrease in conventional systems, especially soil, soil predators, compared to reduced tillage systems. Um, what we found was we did not see a decrease in overall predators, unlike what we expected. And we did not see a decrease in foliar predators. So this is sort of um, more what we expected, right? We didn't really expect that foliar predators were being directly affected by tillage, but we do see that um, decrease in soil predators that we expected. So these reduced tillage systems have more predators than conventional tillage systems. And it's particularly true for no-till. Um, 
So this makes a lot of sense. Um, avoiding tillage benefits, seems to benefit ground predators. It's probably reducing the disruption of life cycles of predators in the soil. So things like this carabid beetle, their larvae are often soil dwelling um, and soil active as well as the adults. Um, having more residue on the soil surface, as you will see in reduced and no-till systems, increases the presence of small, small soil prey. So these are decom often decomposers that are living on the residue. Um, things like uh, mites and springtails really like decomposing these big pieces of corn and soybeans and, and things like spiders love to eat them. And then we also see an increase in microhabitats and microhabitats for predators. So pred a lot of um, ground dwelling predators are not just predators on pests, but they also tend to eat each other. And so the more different little habitats that there are, the more places to hide, um, the, the less predation you have on other predators. So you get sort of a more active, more healthy predator community. So um, we had hypothesized that the more disturbance, the more tillage you had, the lower the arthropod abundance we would be. Instead, we see this sort of very little effect. Um, so it could be that on one hand, disturbance is reducing pest populations. On the other hand, in no-till and reduced till systems, we see more predators. Um, we could also might be seeing more entomopathogens, changes in plant chemistry, and the availability of alternate hosts that could be also decreasing predator abundances. So finally, the last question we had was, do new pests show up in reduced tillage systems? Are we maybe having the same abundance of pests, but we're getting different pests that might be harder to control? So things like slugs can be very challenging to control because they're not susceptible to insecticides. So what we did was compared communities of pests and predators in reduced and conventional systems. Um, and we did this in two ways. We looked at the diversity of these systems. So this um, um, in blue, if this is negative, that would mean there were more diversity in conventional systems. Um, and the positive is there a higher diversity in the uh, reduced tillage systems. And we see no effect for um, pests here. But we do see that there is an increase into the diversity of predators in conventional systems. And that this is not just ground predators, but the combination of ground and foliar predators. The other thing was looked, we looked at was the percentage of overlap of species. So if there was 100% overlap, all of the same species show up in um, reduced till and conventional tilled systems, we would get, uh, we would see everything at a one. And what we see is that there are different communities in, of pests and of predators between these two systems. So um, just to come back to our, our original questions about what type of um, pest is tillage effective against, we don't really see this very effective against all herbivores or herbivores that spend some time in the soil. Um, but we tend to get a problem with herbivores that spend no part of their lives in the soil. So these foliar, um, act, foliar herbivores, things, things like aphids and leafhoppers. Um, our next question was what types of predators could tillage harm? It's not really harming all predators, but it is affecting predators that are associated with the soil as we would expect and predators that are active, and it's not affecting predators that are active in the foliage. So um, I wanna end by sort of co zooming back out to the big picture. What does this mean about recommending tillage as part of uh, an insect pest management scheme, especially um, in the context of IPM? Um, so I think first of all, we need to think long and hard about recommending tillage as a tool to uh, combat insect pests. Tillage is often put under a cultural control, which is sort of the base of our IPM pyramid, sort of a first line of defense against insects. And it has costs. It has costs to predators and it has environmental costs. And so I would argue that we need to maybe think of it a little bit differently. Think of it more like a pesticide where it does have consequences um, on our ecosystems. Um, and 
uh, to, 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 using, to use it as sparingly as possible for insect management rather than as a first step in cultural control. So with that, I would like to thank um, the co-authors on this paper, um, grant funding, and I will take any questions and hopefully I'm still in good time. Um, you are, you're okay. definitely in good time. <laughs> so I haven't seen any questions yet. Okay. Uh, certainly, I think it's, well, perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong. Was it surprising? with the meta-analysis to suspect that tillage um, or that having no tillage was enhancing some of the other mechanisms for um, controlling those, those uh, pests in there. Oh, uh, one note that we do have in here is that European corn borer in Manitoba is controlled by cultivation. Would corn borer have been something that uh, you looked at in this meta-analysis at all? Mm -hmm. Yes, it absolutely was. And the studies that were included in our meta-analysis didn't find very strong effects of cultivation on European corn borer, but I know it's sort of one of the most recommended strategies. Um, so yes, absolutely. And I um, um, yeah, can look up those papers again and, and, and send them around, but um, pretty much uh, they, the European corn borer was included in this meta-analysis for sure. So respectfully agree to disagree that tillage is the way to work. <laughs> right. Oh, um, I just had a comment in here that everybody has to do it in order for it to work, which means- ah, that, okay. Yeah. So maybe that's the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was not taken that then you don't have study. Any to, yeah, exactly. Um, so an, another question that has come up is, where do ants fall in? Are they a general predator or are they specific to a particular pest that they would control or what's their role in all of this? Generally, they when ants are predators, they tend to be generalist predators. Um, so you do see some ants that, uh, ants, ants can be complicated because they often will increase things like aphid abundance and sort of, uh, Push, or they can push off other uh, herbivores that are trying to compete with the aphids. They can also protect the aphids from, um, from other predators. Uh, but generally we, can s we would categorize them as generalist predators. Great. Um, so John Hurd is in the same room as I am. So when you saw me looking kind of angry, it's because he was throwing things at me. Thankfully, someone more politely in the question and answer section asked the same question, which is, have you looked at tillage as far as controlling grasshoppers? And I know that John Goglowski has some thoughts on this, but um, like as far as how they might impact on, on the eggs that have been laid, will they fill in the cracks or will they bring them up to freeze or all that kind of jazz? Where are you at there? Um, so I have not studied grasshoppers in, at all. Um, that's not... It's not a uh, pest that I've had access to, to look at really. Um, we, I don't remember specifically the details of grasshoppers in this analysis. Um, so the answer is, I don't know, <laughs> but I can find out. <laughs> right, and, and that's fair. And then there's a question here, which I also think might be a little bit challenging for you to answer, which would be, would the results be different if you were looking at diseases, for example, fusarium head blight? And I'm assuming that stuff that, you know, lives on debris would, would certainly have an impact on whether tillage is beneficial or not beneficial. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, that's not, that was not something that we considered. Um, so I, I don't know what the interactions would be between diseases and other sort of beneficial organisms that would otherwise control them. And if those beneficial organisms would be decreased by tillage, um, I'm, I imagine that some of this, there's probably some, some overlap in terms of mechanisms there um, that, that you could in, investigate, but I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. And then there is just a conversation or a note that tillage is often based on moisture conservation or weed management, but rarely insect control as a target in some of our geographies. Would you say it's similar in your, in the areas that were in these studies or 
um, how would you characterize that decision making? So the studies here were global. Um, so individual choices about how and what tillage is, is doing um, really depended quite a bit. Um, I mean, as we know that tillage is, like, tillage is useful in, in many contexts and, and uh, I just would like to think about how we're using it for insect control and make sure that we're really um, doing it for a really good reason and for specific pests rather than just sort of preventatively or, or generally. Recreational tillage is what we tend to go with here. <laughs> you know, we've got some spare time and it looks better that way. Um, oh, and then we have a question about um, fungi um, and a big long word in front of it, entomophagus fungi, are they destructed um, at, with tillage uh, as VAM fungi can be with tillage? Any ideas on fungi? Um, so the, um, there's been a few studies looking at entomopathogenic uh, fungi or entomophagous fungi. Um, yes, they are disrupted. Um, it's sort of the, the, the evidence is a little bit mixed. Some people have found an effect, other, people's, other people haven't. Um, so I think it depends, but generally, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We are just about at your time, which um, I mean, John Gavlowski loves to talk. So if he can get an extra few seconds, we'll be happy with that. So again, oh, um, has any of your work looked at flea beetle survivability and subsequent pressure with and without tillage? Um, my impression would be that flea beetles are off to the sides of the field, but perhaps I'm incorrect with that. So they're quite mobile. So um, things like that are may or may not be affected by tillage. I can, so I have a database, it's attached to the study. I can share the study with you all, um, but none of this was my work <laughs> originally, right? right? Yep. So, so it was all sort of based on other people's work. Um, so I have the database with all of the results from that and you can like look up, oh, what, what was the effect overall? Um, would you, I can send you an email and, and if, if people are interested in, in sort of that database and that, that, that study, just to sort of know what individual problems. Um, between, between John Gavlowski and I, I think that would be a fantastic opportunity. John okay. G is, is really our resident expert here. And I think he'll, he'll be able to then help Dane and, and some of the others that have answered these or asked these questions to just make sure that we're drilling down a little bit. So I really yeah. appreciate it, Elizabeth. That does put us at our time. And thank you so much for fitting us in. Um, and again, another round of applause in the room for you.